nation adores you.
my body and soul. Hey, yeah. Every day, time, money, we use up, we waste so much. We spend time and money every day until it's all gone. Precious resources, powerful resources. What if you, what if you reinvested your time into prayer, your resources into support to help us plant churches, prepare leaders, and proclaim the gospel? What if you became a prayer fellowship partner? GOGF has been planting churches, preparing leaders, and proclaiming the gospel throughout the world since 1961. 14 churches on the eastern seaboard, producing weekly radio broadcasts that reach around the globe. We have ministry training in India, Africa, and the Caribbean. Partner with us. Partner with God. Invest in expanding and supporting His kingdom worldwide. Become a prayer fellowship partner. You have the time and resources to make a difference. Bibles, if you will, to, um, to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, starting at verse 18, that portion that was read earlier. John chapter 15, starting at verse 18. And we're going to take this section of scripture, and you'll notice in your bulletin that what was mentioned in the, in the bulletin, the title of this message is, Don't be a hater, but be hated. Don't be a hater, but be hated. Let's pray together and ask for God's help. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that you would minister to us, challenge us, change us. And Lord, uh, may this time in your word be profitable in each one of our lives. And we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, most of us want to be liked. And the reason that we want to be liked is because we like ourselves. Isn't that true? I mean, we're in love with ourselves, so we want everybody else to have the same appreciation that we have and to, to love us as well. And, uh, and, and we also, we want to be liked by the right crowd. 
Um, uh, but what ends up happening many times is that, is that even the people who hate us, the people who can't stand us, we go out of our way, sometimes even compromise our principles in order to get them to like us. And uh, that's what happens on a day-to-day -day basis in many of our lives. We compromise that position, even the people that condemn us and hate us. The end of chapter 15 challenges us not to hate back, not to be a hater, but to become comfortable with being hated. Uh, you need to be who God wants you to be, whether somebody else likes it or not. Amen. Amen. And that's difficult. It's much easier said than done. But let's notice a few things that are mentioned here in the text. First of all, in verse 18, I want you to see that Jesus knew what it was to be hated by the world. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And so Jesus knew what it was to be hated. From the very beginning of his ministry, we find Jesus being confronted and opposed by the establishment. We find Jesus being hated by the Pharisees. We find Jesus being hated by the Sanhedrin, those uh, Jewish leaders. We find him being challenged by the scribes. Uh, all represented uh, the status quo of the day. And they concluded that Jesus was just not politically correct. And so they stood against him and they hated him. And all of that hate by all the various corners of society, it all culminated as we see Jesus there on the cross. And if you remember, the people, the same people who on Palm Sunday, they laid down those palm branches and shouted out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Uh, those were the same people who turned around and said, crucify him, crucify him. And so we, we find that uh, all that hatred came together uh, at his crucifixion. Uh, all that hatred was sort of like pressed into a pressure nozzle. If you ever like used a pressure washer, it, it brings all that into a small space and it comes out with a lot of force. And that hatred uh, came out with a force that was finally released when that spear was thrust into the side of our Lord. Uh, it was hatred from the world toward Jesus. But even in the midst of all that hatred, that he faced, what did Jesus say? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was able in the face of all that hatred to not allow himself to respond in like manner. He knew something that some of us need to learn. He had something going for him that allowed him to respond to hatred with love and with forgiveness. And so I want you to notice that uh, all through uh, Jesus' life, he demonstrated love for people and love for God, even in the midst of hatred. Let me tell you something. If you want to define what is missing in many of our lives, it is simply this that we don't love God and love others more than we love ourselves. Amen. We love ourselves far more than we love God and love others. That's what's missing. Uh, and so I want to challenge you today that as we think about uh, being who God wants us to be in the face of the world who hates us, uh, we need to establish that kind of love and find it in our hearts to love God and love others even when they hate us. The second thing I want you to see is in verse 19. In verse 19, he says, if you were of the world, the, word the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. As we abide in Christ, listen to me now, as we abide in Christ, the world is going to hate you. If you are walking with the Lord, the world is going to hate you. In fact, if you find yourself buddy-buddy with everybody in the world, there's a problem. 
If you find yourself agreeing with everything that's being said down at the barbershop, there's a problem. If you can't point to somebody who disagrees with your stand for Jesus, then there's a problem because as you walk toward God, as you walk and follow him, as you abide in Christ, the world's going to stand against that. Because the world hated him, he's going to hate you as well. Jesus is here instructing his disciples at the Last Supper. You remember we've been talking about this discussion that he's been having with his disciples. Uh, and he's about to be crucified. He's about to be arrested and taken away. And he's sharing with them how he wants them to proceed. How he wants them to live after he leaves to go prepare a place for him. And right before his arrest, he's telling them now that, that not only is he hated, not only have they witnessed hatred against him, but that they also, if they continue to walk with him, are, they're also going to be hated. As they exhibit his character, they're going to be hated. As they shine the light of the kingdom of God, they are also going to be hated. As they go into the world and declare the good news of Jesus Christ, the world is going to stand against that. As they stand for the, the morality that God uh, wants us to live by, the world is going to hate that. And they are going to be hated and persecuted. You know, during China's uh, Boxer Rebellion in the early 1900s, and there are many, many stories. If you go online, you can check all the stories that went on when Christians were being persecuted in China. And uh, there's a, a one story that, that uh, it's about a, a mission that the soldiers surrounded. And there were about 100 Christians that were in the building at the time. And they, they surrounded the building and the soldiers laid a cross at the front door on the ground, flat on the ground. And they told the people inside, they said, listen, if you will denounce your Christianity and show it by trampling on the cross on your way out, then you can go and leave. But if you won't denounce Christianity and you won't trample on the cross on your way out, then you need to step over here because we're going to have a firing squad. Now, the first few people that came out, in fact, the story goes, the first seven people that came out trying to save their own life, they walked around the, 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 the cross for a little bit, and then they, they thought again, and they walked and trampled on the cross, and they, their life was spared. Then a little girl came out, and this young girl got up to the cross and knelt down before the cross and prayed for strength to be able to stand up in face of the firing squad. And then she got up and stepped to the side and went over where the firing squad. Her simple act touched all the rest of the people inside and encouraged them and gave them the strength so that one by one, the other 90 some people came out and walked around the cross and did not denounce their faith and they died that day. You know, you have to come to the place where you love God more than you love yourself if you're going to stand up like that. And it's not just a firing squad against persecutors of the faith. I'm talking about on your job, in the lunchroom. You got to love God more than you love yourself to stand up and walk for him. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. And in our society, if you abide in Christ and you stand up for Jesus, you are going to be hated because they hated him and they're going to hate you. Amen. Amen. And so uh, we, we have been fortunate in this country that we don't see that kind of persecution like they had in China. But you know what? It's coming. And uh, there are a lot of other countries around the world where Christians are being persecuted today.
There are a lot of places around the globe where they can't gather freely like this and worship. There are a lot of places where if you get caught in a church meeting, you get arrested and thrown in jail. And, and in order to continue to serve God, you have to come to the place where you love God more than you love yourself. And that's the challenge. The time is not far ahead when it's going to be illegal right here in America to stand up for biblical morality. It's coming. They're already calling you bigots and narrow minded people. And pretty soon it's going to be illegal. Do you know, as a as a broadcaster on the radio, one of the things, one of the notices I get, you can't say some of the stuff that you can say here. You can't even put that on the air in Canada. It's illegal in Canada. I'm not talking about some Middle East country. I'm talking about Canada. It's coming. And we need to decide now before it gets here, do we love God? Are we going to stand up for his word and his principles? Or are we going to protect ourselves and compromise? Amen. So we need to be ready to wear the badge of persecution and we need to be ready to wear it with pride. You know, put that fish on your lapel, that cross in your mouth and wear it with pride, knowing that it's going to take you to persecution. The time is now to be able to resist being a hater, even while being hated. But let's move on because our time is short today. Verse 21. Verse 21, he says, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. In other words, Jesus is saying, don't get too upset with them. You don't need to hate them. As a matter of fact, you need to pray for them. You need to feel sorrow for them because they just don't know. They don't know that they don't know what it's like to have the spirit of God reveal himself to them. They don't know what it is to have their prayers answered. They just don't know. They don't know what it is to see God make a way where there seems to be no way. Uh, they don't know what it is to see the relevance of God's word in their lives. Uh, they, they don't know what it is like to get filled up with worship. They, they just don't know. And so rather than while they're hating you, rather than hating them back, we need to say a prayer for them. Father, forgive them because they just don't know. And, and, and so we need to not respond in hatred back. Uh, we need to respond in love and concern. It, it makes me want to share what God has done in my life when, when people are in front of me and they just don't know. Uh, we need to be able to share our testimony and what God is doing in our lives. We're to love those that are lost. We're to minister to those that are outside the household of faith uh, as we love one another in the household of faith. And, and so our response to a world that hates us and opposes us is a response of love in return. We need to love God and love others. So don't be a hater, but be willing to be hated for the sake of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that needs to be our pattern. That needs to be what we walk after. That needs to be regulating the way that we live our lives as well. Amen? Amen. And then in verses 22 and 24, he says, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. In other words, not only do they hate us because they don't know, but the hatred of Christian comes from having their sin exposed. Jesus is saying simply that people don't like to have their sin put on blast. People don't like to have their sin exposed. And when you expose what they're doing as wrong, they're going to come out flinging and hating and swinging. 
Uh, and we need to expect that because we stand in opposition to everything that they want to do. And we can understand why the world hates us. I mean, just put yourself in, in the shoes of the non-believer. We can understand why they hate us as intently as they do. Uh, everything that the world values, we're denouncing. Everything they want to do, everything they enjoy, we're coming against. Immoral pleasures, we got a verse against it. Materialism, we got a verse against it. The focus on this life only, we stand up against it because we're looking toward another life after this. Secular humanism that says that we can have all the answers, we can produce all the answers. Uh, we, we need to make sure that we understand why they hate us because we stand against everything that they appreciate and everything that they desire. But in the midst of all that the world is saying and all that the world wants to do, Jesus stands up and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. And so that leaves us with no other option but to stand and to walk with Jesus. Amen. And the world can't stand it because it goes against everything that they value. Understanding the perspective of those outside of Christ should produce empathy and not hate. It should produce a desire to lead them and to show them not a, a desire to push them away. Their blindness should drive us to pray, not to hate. Marching against them won't change the world. Somebody needs to hear this. Voting against them won't change the world. Uh-huh. Now, those things are good, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't march. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't vote. In fact, we should. And we should exercise our democratic rights in a democratic society. But understand, when you go in the voting booth and you exercise all your rights as an American, that's not going to change the world. The world is still going to hate you. And the world's going to continue to stand against you. The only way that we can change the world is as they see the love of God in us. As they see the love of God and love for others lived out in our lives. The world is going to be changed as our proclamation of the gospel is backed up by our demonstration of love. As people become uh, acquainted with an alternative lifestyle. Amen. As people see an alternative lifestyle in you, that's how the world is going to be changed. The world's going to be changed one life at a time. And uh, we need to be, each one of us need to be one of those lives that will change the world. And so uh, the love of God flowing through us and touching other people around us, uh, that's how we're going to make a difference in the world around us. So don't be a hater. Be a channel of God's love even while you are being hated. Now, I wonder, boy, if we had, you know, like testimony time, could, I, I wonder how many of us have had the experience of somebody who can't stand you, but you reached out in love and did something for them anyway. Uh-huh. And, and, and really, that's where we need to be. We need to be lovers of God and lovers of others, even in the context of all the hatred that we face in the world. But, but in verse 25, he says, make sure that the world's hatred of you is without a cause. Amen. 
Look at verse 25. This happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And uh, Asaph is quoted here in Psalm 69, 4. And Jesus here gives it prophetic significance as he relates it to his own life. And, uh, you know, if you know the story of David in the Old Testament, David was, uh, you know, he was prophesied to be the next king. And so because of that, Saul got very jealous of him. And uh, David had to run and hide from Saul. Saul kept coming after him and trying to, you know, find him. And there were opportunities, even while Saul was pursuing him with hatred and desiring to kill him, there were opportunities for David to respond back with hatred. He could have killed Saul couple of times, but he didn't. He responded in love. It's an example for you and, not, and me as we walk through our lives and there are people who come against us. But, but what Jesus is saying is, is, is that just like David, Jesus and you and I need to make sure that the hatred against us is without a cause. That we don't do anything that justifies their hatred against us. That we need to make sure that our lives are above reproach. That our lives, our walk is lined up with our talk. Amen. And that, and that uh, our, our love is supersedes any bitterness and malice and hatred. We need to make sure that nobody can point a finger to us and say, that's why, see what he did, that's why I can't stand him. <laughs> and so we need to make sure that we are hated without a cause. David was careful not to give King Saul a reason to hate him. And we need to make sure that we're just as careful today. And so my question today as we close are, are you ready to be hated by the world? And the challenging question, even aside from that, is do you love God more than you love yourself? And if that's a tough question, and it is, it should be for all of us. The answer is we need to take a fresh look at Jesus on the cross. And we need to see again all that he's done for us, how much he loved us. And allow that vision of Jesus on the cross to, to stir up in our hearts a love for him that will regulate our lives, that will allow us to respond in love even to those who oppose us. Amen. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I wonder in the quietness of your heart, just ask yourself that question. Lord, do I love you more than I love myself, my own life? Am I ready to follow Jesus even at the cost of my own life? At the cost of my popularity, my being liked, my being accepted. Ask the Lord to help you. And Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to commit this time into your hands. The message has gone forth in the frailty of flesh. But Lord, we ask that you would cause that it would be resurrected in our lives. Change us, we pray. Stir up the love of God that would constrain us. That would be greater than our love for ourselves, greater than the selfishness of our sin, greater than all of our desires as people here on this earth. Lord, we love you. We adore you. May it be more and more and more. In Jesus' name, amen.